Right, so I'm here to talk about uh, some changes which I've made to Payuno for the next release of LibreOffice. Yeah. Now, can anybody first tell me if they've ever even heard of Payuno? Um, yes. Okay, yes. good, several, excellent. And otherwise interested in Python? And I suppose the rest of you are here waiting for the party to start. <laughs> uh, so, as of LibreOffice 5.0, uh, Payuno was, to be honest, in a little bit of a sorry state. Um, it was first implemented when Python was barely recognisable in the form that it is now, and has hardly changed in the time since. Uh, when you use it to interact with LibreOffice, it feels an awful lot like writing in Java, and at that point, why wouldn't you write it in Java? and uh, it was rather slower than it should be, especially when uh, you use it as a remote process, which is a quite common use case, especially for processing documents. So what I hope to achieve with the changes which uh, are already committed on master and should become part of uh, 5.1 is that the syntax of using Pino, using you know, in Python, should feel a lot more Pythonic than it is now. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so you can do a lot more with a lot less verbosity, making use of the syntax that Python has to do various tasks. And also it should be faster than before. And finally, my personal goal, the reason why I started out on this in the first place, and I hope some of you may come to my talk on this tomorrow, is that I hope to use this in the context of uh, user interface testing to make Python the go-to solution for making that work for LibreOffice, something we don't yet have anything about. Okay. So, uh, the remainder of this talk is pretty technical, so I'm very glad that some people have actually used Pymino before. Um, the, one of the major new features is that wherever there is a collection interface, in uh, a unit object exposed to Pyuno, and you can now use that in the style you'd expect to with Python. So, in the case of objects implementing the X index uh, interfaces, you can now use these exactly like Python lists. So, where before you might have had to make method calls in a very Java like way, such as get count, get by index, now instead of that, you can simply do the Python thing, which is to call len and use square brackets to subscript it. Yeah. And that includes, although this isn't a feature that I expect many people will ever have to use, uh, using uh, extended slice syntax. Um, throughout the various you know, interfaces that LibreOffice supports, there are far more uh, interfaces for reading than writing. So if you look down the list, you'll have to be quite hard pressed to find things which use uh, index interfaces to write, and especially later the uh, named access interfaces to write. But for reading lists, that's an extremely common thing, and you'll find it throughout the entire uh, program interface. And of course, not only that, you can also do what you'd expect on a list in terms of iterating. Um, although if you do the if in syntax, that will, under the hood, uh, iterate through the entire list, so don't expect that to be especially fast. Um, so one example, if you are iterating over document footnotes in a text document, uh, before you would have to do this, First, call get count, and then for each of those indices, call get by index. Uh, now, instead of that, you can simply use len and the subscript index, or if you don't care about the index, you can simply use a for in loop directly on the footnotes object in the text uh, Some other examples, again, there are hundreds of these, but the obvious ones for text documents. Deleting uh, members. Um, the important 
thing to remember for this is that just like the Python bit, um, in this case, what for and if work on is keys rather than values. So if you do this with uh, the X index interface objects, you will get values in this case, but uh, for the X name objects, you get keys instead, same as the Python did. Um, so again, some obvious cases, uh, accessing sheets of the spreadsheet by name and the name range name range in the spreadsheet. The old way you use the method access and now you can simply subject. Um, anyone who's used you know for a while probably realizes that both of these things can coexist in one object. They are merely interfaces. An object can be accessed by index and by name at the same time. What happens when you do that? It just works. Uh, you can access it by index and by name using the obvious syntax, but you should be aware that it will take the dict choice if you iterate over it and get the keys rather than the values, because that seems the more useful thing to do in general. Uh, again, a few examples. If you're interested in this, you probably either know or can find it in the app where all the other hundred of these are. And the third of the triple of collection interfaces, enumeration access, uh, they now work like Python iterators. Uh, whenever you see a method call to create an enumeration, uh, instead you can now simply use for value in an object. Very simple. If you really want to, you can make an English iterator using the insert Python function as well. So uh, an example, a very common thing to do if you're working with documents is to iterate over the paragraphs. Before this took several lines of code, a lot of typing, lots of method names. So that now you can simply quite simply do uh, iterate over it. Now, because there may be a very large number of paragraphs in the document, this interface doesn't support uh, indexed access. You have to iterate over it. But uh, a useful thing to do if you know there are going to be a few paragraphs is that you can flatten it using the Python list function, list operator, to turn uh, all the paragraphs into a list. And then you can index it yourself. Don't do this if there are 10,000 of them. You'll be waiting for a long time for the method to finish. Uh, one large wart on the IUNO uh, app before was that in certain instances you had to do this funny dance called uh, a human method that expects uh, its argument to be an any with a certain type and Pyuno didn't like you to do that at all. It tried very hard to hide the explicit any. Uh, now, instead, it correctly allows you to simply do this the short way and assign what you'd expect to to uh, one of the few cases which required this. It's a small thing, but it really annoyed me every time I saw this as the solution to the problem. Slightly of a trick only. Anytime you have uh, something which in this case, my example is uh, the data array of a table, which presents the content of a table as an array. You can now assign a generator expression to that directly, uh, or in fact, anything which is true. So, a simple example to the uh, result of doing this is I've used this uh, generator expression and written the number of the table. Sure, if you have to use this, you can't find some more interesting to do. Another common use case is everywhere in the app you will find property values, which are key value pairs. Um, they unfortunately also have a couple of other fields, which you usually don't need to know anything about. But previously you were forced to either create one empty and fill in the bits you want yourself, or use all four of the 
members, even though you don't care about two of them. So I relaxed that. Um, in the case where you don't name your uh, arguments, you still have to give all of them. But when you do, it doesn't force you to give the other ones the uh, I didn't see a way that that could break anything, so I prepared and did it. Now, um, for cell ranges, cell ranges are applied to text tables and to spreadsheets and define an area of uh, the cells within them. This is rather outside the core, you know, API, all the previous collection interfaces, um, that is part of the core API, but this one is specific to calc and to writer. But it is so commonly used that I made the special uh, syntactic sugar for this to make it easier to use. And again, this is a form of uh, index access. And this syntax here with the comma isn't generally used in core Python, but it does, it is available and it's used by the NumPy scientific extension. So I borrowed this and now wherever you have Excel range, you can access your spreadsheet or table simply by its coordinates, including uh, slices. They're also you can create a 2D cell range from any existing cell range. Or you can do it by um, calc style uh, row column or name range. All just works by uh, indexing. Uh, there is a small controversy with this one that uh, unlike the API which previously existed, which expects the argument to be in um, one way round, they are the other way round in this, and that is because that is the way that NumPy expects them. So to conform with the Python expectation, I made this in the Python order, otherwise anyone who comes from this Python background will be very confused. Uh, and the same applies to the uh, range slice. In fact, it's the same thing. Um, now, there is a very slight difference in this case between the text table uh, instance and the same for uh, a spreadsheet. The text tables in Writer try quite hard to pretend to be uh, like a spreadsheet, but they're not exactly the same. Uh, a spreadsheet is always a square uh, array underneath. So even if you hide some of its cells, they're still really there. The same isn't true for a writer text table. Each row can have a completely independent number of cells in it. So in this case, um, you can't slice whole rows and columns of a writer text table because they don't exist in that sense. Small tidy up. There wasn't previously a way to equal a whole constant group. As I was working on my user interface testing work, I realized that that would be a nice thing to have. So now we can simply import a whole constant group by name and then refer to its members as uh, uh, like an object member. Um, hash values. If you hope to put a high object into a dict, that wouldn't previously work very well if you got the same object from a new API in more than one way or at more than one time. It might work better now, and I say might. Um, I'm not entirely convinced this works as well as it should do yet, so please take care if you ever have to use this one to check that it works. It didn't before, perhaps it works now, perhaps not. We still need to test that one. And finally, some performance improvements. Uh, while working on this, I realized that the uh, Pioneer code was doing some extremely silly things. Now, to uh, instantiate uh, a unit object on the Python side, you have to make various queries against the Brighton and Lever Office process. Uh, unfortunately, it was doing rather more than was strictly necessary. You'd imagine that a few would be enough, 
but in fact it was doing up to 50 calls for every single Python object crossing across the bridge to the client side of the process. And uh, the amount of time this took, you could almost time on a watch. So I fixed that. Now it's going to be a lot faster, uh, including in the, a little faster in the, in the local case. Perhaps not so much that you could notice without testing very hard, but a little faster. Uh, the results of this. Now, a major aim of the changes was not to break the existing code. Did I succeed? Almost. Um, I hoped very much not to break anything. In fact, it turns out I have broken one thing in a way that can't be fixed without changing the Python code. Luckily, it's one of ours. And that is in the Libra logo code, so a feature that most people don't even know exists. Who knows that Libra logo exists? Really? Okay, well, see, this is the, this is the benefit of actually coming to a LibreOffice conference. You know about all the obscure features. Well, did you also know that it's really written in Python underneath? Who knew that? And oh, all okay, still some, some hands, excellent. So what happened was, um, inside the Libra logo code, there was a, a variable which contained either zero or a PyUno object, and it expected that choice to be one of true or false when you evaluated it. Unfortunately now, when the object is a collection, the collection is true when it's, when it's got a member. When it's empty, it's false, and I broke the code because of this. Always Sorry about that. And thanks to Laszlo for fixing it. No problem. Ah, oh, there you are, right. Thanks, thanks for your work. So, so, so you can fix it in Libre Logo because yes. uh, it's, it's easy little, to fix the it. The check is a little bit insane. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, so I, it's been, yeah. I tried to think of a way in which that could mm -hmm. break existing code. I didn't think of one, but one existed. That's the nature of code in the wild, unfortunately. It does <laughs> yes. all the things you can't possibly predict. <laughs> Question then. Is it still possible to use East 9 and then the code will still work after your changes? Uh, is none? So even um, whatever is your collection, uh, it's never uh, true uh, if you say is none. Uh, no, it shouldn't be none, but uh, Python has a separate interface for determining whether something is true or false. And in the case of uh, something which now behaves like a list, list or dict because it's got the x index or x name interfaces that will now depend on whether it has uh, a member inside it. If it doesn't have any contents, then it will be false. If it does, then it will be true. And neither is none, right? Uh, neither is none. None is a separate value. Yes, true, false, and none are three, three separate things in Python. And we've already reached the question. Does anyone else have a question? Please. So first, this is really excellent work, especially that going to the native Python constructs for iterating and so on and so on and so on. Well, I'm sure it will be used. Yes, so um, I have uh, two remarks. Maybe, please, please, please. Maybe we can also continue this in a... Uh, oh, by all means. Um, I'll be at the Hackfest later if you're coming. Um, I will be at the party, but we can... Stay okay, oh, well, we might meet in the middle of dinner then. So, um, so this high-level interface for access, accessing tables and so on. Yes. Maybe it's a, it's a little bit fancy, it's a little bit magic. Yes. But and if you're mangling a spreadsheet and you want to do certain things with ranges of cells, I imagine it could be all... Yeah, yes, it's, it's very helpful, but yes. maybe... Maybe I've already done it, provided in separate modules that you can have the vanilla pi uno, and if you and just mm. don't have to, and I don't know whether this is feasible. It's just a remark. So it's a little difficult to yeah. implement this as an extension and still have it uh, behave in a performant way. Yes. You, there is a way of doing it which I considered. The <coughs> problem is that it's slow and may involve doing rather more uh, calls to the uh, controlling LibreOffice process than would be the case uh, as I've implemented it inside the Unicode. But it is, in terms of how, how it's implemented, the PyUno uh, C++ source um, can only depend on the core interfaces. So the special affordance for the cell ranges is a soft dependency in the code. Mm. It looks it up dynamically to make sure it's there before it uses it. There's no dependency in C code. So this was the minor remark. This was a major remark. You know there is this code to set up a new 
LibreOffice processes. Okay, I kind of uh, skimmed over that because it can be quite long and there are various ways of doing it. Uh, yes, but uh, my major criticism uh, concerning this code is that I think it should distinguish two use cases where there's only just one interfaces. There is this use case where start in some kind of augmented LibreOffice environment within the context of the current user, so they're using the current user's LibreOffice profile and so on, starting LibreOffice uh, visually and then doing some, some things inside there. But in my view, it should be distinguished from the other use case, which says, well, I want to maybe turn an open document into a PDF, in the LibreOffice process for this, but I don't want to interfere with the current user settings and so on and so on and so on and so on. Uh, you you effectively want to, to run in a um, with an isolated user profile. That's already possible. You can you're quite happy to set the entire LibreOffice profile process to use a clean user profile. Yes, I know this, but uh, I think there's only one interface, so I cannot distinguish the two use cases. But it's a rather special thing. Maybe we can discuss it. Okay, uh, please. Uh, we'll yeah. work on that one later on. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions at the back? Yes. Uh, I'm not a Python programmer myself, but I, I still understand how excellent this is. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just asking, why didn't anyone think of this before? <laughs> <laughs> Even if they had, um, it requires a certain level of uh, Python knowledge, which I in no way, shape, or form had before starting this pro process, and half of which has probably already fallen out of my head, which doesn't bode well for any future bugs, but I will do my best. Um, the, the whole Pioneer code has been rather unloved for most of its history. It's been maintained to the point that it works, but nobody has taken the time to improve it in very significant ways for a long time. Okay, thank you.